Okay, I see the green light. Okay. All right. Good morning. My name is Belinda Yan Lieberman. Uh, I work at the Cleveland Clinic, and my job title is I'm the medical director of clinical and molecular virology laboratory. So I'm a lab person. I'm not OBGYN. So title of my talk today uh, is Cervical Cancer, a Preventable Disease, the Role of a Human Papilloma Testing, that's what HPV stands for, in a clinical lab. I have some disclosure on this slide. Now, I would like to go over four or five points this morning. And first, what everyone needs to know about the human papilloma virus and what's the clinical significance of testing HPV in women. And also uh, letting you know, uh, you know present you some evidence showing uh, there are actually FDA cleared two vaccines on, to prevent human papilloma infection or cervical cancer in women. And this is uh, the first time vaccine actually literally can cure cancer. And it's a very uh, exciting time. And uh, what uh, share with you what we do here at the Cleveland Clinic, it's Cleveland, Ohio, is right in the middle or north middle of the United States. Uh, so uh, we have been doing uh, testing of human papilloma virus by molecular test, also uh, doing the pap smear at the same time. So we call this co-testing. I'll share with you some of our experience doing co-testing in Cleveland Clinic, and we've been doing this for almost 10 years. Last but not least, uh, time has come, and then the question we're gonna ask is, uh, can the molecular pap, that is HPV test, can serve as a primary screen? So the first few slides I introduce you. I'm being virologist. And we're going to learn a little bit more about human papilloma virus. From there on, I'm just going to call HPV. So human papilloma virus, HPV, is actually the most common sexually transmitted infections in the United States. I'm sure in the world, with about in the United States about 6.2 million cases diagnosed every year. That's astonishing. Also. Uh, same time in uh, 2008, and the Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Harold Zuhausen. The reason is he actually, being a pathologist, lab person, he discovered the human papillomavirus that is the reason cause cancer, cervical cancer in women. So this is a, a very no, uh, you know, uh, in, interesting fact to know. So again. So HPV is right now established. There are a lot of uh, publication and facts and the proof that human papillomavirus is the primary causal factor of cervical cancer and cervical disease in women. So quickly, how did this happen? So a little bit of history. In 1980, Dr. Harold Zuhausen, pathologist in Germany, he linked cervical cancer with HPV. I will describe what he did. He saved a lot of slides as a pathologist. People, a woman died of cancer, they, you know, pathology will do a biopsy, they make a block, they save the, uh, they save the, uh, the cells in the paraffin block, they cut the block, make the slide, they read the slide looking for evidence of uh, cancer looking cells. And that's what he did and he, did a lot, he, apparently they saved a lot of slides and the woman died of cervical cancer or similar type of uh, disease. And then he was able to show them, looking the slide and looking for evidence in the cells of the woman, the disease, and during, due to cancer, looking for evidence of human papilloma virus footprint. So what he essentially did is what we call in situ hybridization. He was able to uh, find 99.7%, uh, almost 100% of all the slides 
uh, from women died, uh, from women from cervical squamous cell cancer, they all have human papillomavirus nucleosis sequence. At the same time, a different group of women that are younger than 40, they uh, had adenocarcinoma in the woman. It's a different area of the service. And then 89% of those sample uh, show evidence, uh, positive evidence of HPV. He was also cloning a lot of uh, virus. Uh, so at that time, 1980, he already had developed the different type of the human papillomavirus. So he actually published indicating the type 16 and type 18 were the worst. And that if the, you know, the cancer is a lot worse. And then you also list 31, 35, 45, 51, 52, the lot more I will show you later. This all correlate the presence of this subtype HPV correlate of the presence of cervical cancer in the woman. And uh, he also did a statistic uh, around you know, almost 40% of women when they are positive for 16, 18 subtype HPV, they eventually develop advanced into, you know, C, sing, uh, sing 2, sing 3, that means cervical intraepithelial neoplasm, that means tumor, and that in within two years. This is really shocking and good evidence showing. About this time, when Dr. Her uh, Harold Zuhausen was working on this, starting from 1980 until a few years later, but not until 1996, that is 16 years later, the WHO, European Organization, as well as National Institute of Health, all re endorsed and recognized that this is the cause of cervical cancer, human papillomavirus. So this is a slide I got from the Google. When Dr. Uh, Zuhausen accept his Nobel Laureate uh, Prize, he gave a quick speech there's a really nice diagram that anybody can see, can, uh, can be you know, convinced what he was saying. He said the HPV is a DNA virus. It's a double-stranded DNA, small virus, about 50 nanometer in size, and then it has an envelope called capsid. And so it's a circular double strand. It's also no, no, no envelope. We call the naked virus. It's protected by a uh, called capsid protein. And uh, the, he also uh, mentioned there are more than 100 different type H human papilloma types were known and discovered. Among those, HPV 16, 18 caused 70% of the, all the cervical cancer in women at that time when he studied. And then how did that happen? This virus uh, in fact, easily in fact, epithelial cells in a cervical mucosa. And the, the HPV DNA, that is the nucleosid of the virus, it will integrate into the, see this epithelial layer, this virus enter, it will settle down on the basal, infected basal cell. Then throughout the weeks, weeks, the virus will replicate from one cell to two cells to you know, spread throughout the other cell. And so, uh, not only spread, and then also they complete, you know, replicate, and then going to uh, in depth throughout the entire layer. This is the time he mentioned. A lot of times, when people have this, this is the time if an individual has good immune uh, system uh, potential, they actually ninety ninety percent, nine zero percent, the individual. Uh, actually heal within two years. We also uh, know there's a many, many articles mention that human papilloma rise is in, in fact uh, most common in teenagers and women and the, but in the early 20s, but the decrease in prevalence until before about age 30, most, a lot of them can clear over 90%. And this is what he was trying to address. And this has been shown by many other investigators. As the, uh, in fact, the episode Theta cell continues 10 to 30 years. What that means if people never get tested, they never know because it is asymptomatic. So 10 to 30 years later, 
the virus will be integrated into the invasive cancer. They integrate in the chromosome. So they include in the tumor cell DNA, and they eventually end up becoming invasive cancer. Remember, no matter what happened in, in the case of this, the cervical cancer is a curable disease, bear that in mind. So quickly on the virus, it uh, belongs to a family called Papova virus. That means a small DNA with double strand DNA, DNA virus, small, and they have a little uh, sort of capsule, more than 100 different type. It is very invasive. You like to invade mucosa membrane, skin through laceration. And then the different strain produce different lesions. And they have a tropi tropism, that means they predilect for certain type of cell. And so they like you know, skin, genital, and oral mucosa was easy to enter. Now, again, I, next slide showing you know, all this type of human papilloma. This has all been published in the experiment document. You can see all kind of disease on the left side start from common war, plantar war, flat war, all anal genital war, all the way to oral papilloma. And I'm sure a lot of us heard recently a lot of head neck cancer is also uh, found, they found the human papilloma virus. But the one that I have highlighted here is a genital cancer. This subtype of 30 or so um, HPV are the ones that have shown connection correlated with uh, causing uh, part of a, called a, the human cervical uh, cancers. So this is, uh, I just, we don't need to memorize, this show this almost like a family tree of the hundred, more than 100 different kind of HPV. They are sort of all from one group, um, Pepo, uh, Pepova, VRD, but they all are human papilloma virus. The one highlight in red on the top of the slide, this is the one that have been shown correlated, related, I have a cause, uh, show the reason uh, that uh, cause cervical cancer in human. And there are three, they are indeterminate, you know, 26, 53, 66 type, they are uh, cost but much lower risk. And then again, the so same thing, this time we divide high risk and low risk. Above this line, and it says mucosa genital HPV type. Above this line, this uh, that we call low risk. Low risk does not mean no, no risk. And then the genital ward as well as uh, when you see low grade PEP changes when uh, cytologists read a slide, oftentimes they are some this type. And then be below this line, you know, this uh, highlight in yellow, the high grade PEP changes. So this group of virus here, we call them high risk human papilloma virus. Also, a lot of people call HPV HR, that means high risk. So the, the type of HPV written in the letter in the blue box. This is the one currently the FDA approved HPV test being PCR hybridization and the currently they, they, that's what they're using uh, uh, for the, the HPV test that used by many people's lab uh, hospital including our lab. So I mentioned to you about the vaccine and then Dr. Marhoza at a Nobel Prize. Now finally vaccine. Vaccine was developed two years before Dr. Uh, Zohausen got his Nobel Prize, maybe the trigger. So there are two HPV vaccine by Merck, by Galaxo, or else come. And they both have the 16, 18 type, but the Merck has 16, 18, six, and 11, so this is the one most of people use, and we call them quadrivalent. And even the, uh, uh, the, it's good news because the vaccine for more than 10, 20 years studies showing it actually can prevent advancement of cervical cancer, prevent cancer if they are vaccinated early. And uh, this is the vial from the Merck quadrivalent, it's called God cell. Now, so since we know HPV is the primary cause of cervical cancer, we also know there are 100 different types. We also know that about 30 some subtypes, they are high risk. High risk means they all are linked to cause cervical cancer. So the 
So the, what's the role of a laboratory? So if you can detect sample, detect a positive high-risk HPV, detection of HPV in the sample is associated with 250 50 times risk, increased risk of a high-grade CIM, means high-grade cervical intraepithelial neoplasm. Neoplasm means tumor. So in high-grade, eventually you're going to have cancer. And then I mentioned the 30 type and the primary in, in fact, the squamous cell. So, so worldwide, quickly stat, you know, in 2002, I just glanced the 2012 statistics, it's almost the same. So in 2002, worldwide, it's almost half million women de developed the cancer. And you can see 274, it's about 50, a little bit over 50% uh, you know, other individual, they die from cervical cancer. And they estimated 291 million women are infected with high-risk HPV type. Remember, many times, unless they get really advanced stage, they are totally asymptomatic. So in the United States, uh, the, about 11 to 12,000 cases of cervical cancer are being uh, diagnosed. Uh, in, in 2012, it showed about a little bit higher than 11,000. And but annually, if you check on the statistic, even Google, about 4,000 deaths annually, which can be prevented, remember. And that's why, you know, uh, the laboratory tests are going to play a major role together with the vaccine. And in the United States every year, 6 to 8 million cervical infection, that they, they, you know, so they, it was uh, reported. That's really high. And so this is a paper everybody call is uh, a pharma pathologist. It's very, very good showing that many women really clear the HPV infection within 9 to 15 months due to the intact immunity, you know, uh, intact uh, immune. And so HPV infection can be, you know, latent means quiescent for many years. The only way you can find out is to get tested. Therefore, when you go get your physical, there'll be a good time to ask if that's possible. Um, HPV uh, development, we mentioned, you know, if you develop positive, it's 250 fold, you're higher risk than uh, the others. And then also persistent, the most important part is this lead work, persistent. If you continue to have HPV, if you don't get tests, you don't know, so you can live until you get older, boom, you can be diagnosed with cervical cancer. So persistent high-risk HPV is necessary for the development of advanced cancer. This is the same, uh, different diagram delivered the same messages showing that in the, in the upper letter, you can say on the top line, normally, you know, the, the epithelial in service look like this, normal service, nice, lined up really nice. And then if the virus particle came in, settled down in the base layer, start replicating, and you start having abnormal, the cytology is going to read the slide, then you'll find out SRL means squamous intraepithelial lesion. They so show this abnormality in your cervical cells. And then if you keep going when the virus infect the cell, it's going to spread, infect more, you can actually go to cervical intraepithelial lesion. It's uh, really uh, it's, uh, apparently easily to be identified by cytology. Even the cervical intraepithelial lesion, CIA, it has CIA in one, two, three. The higher the number, the worse the disease. Eventually, tumors start form. The cell become tumor. Then the HPV genome is incorporated in the entire uh, the epithelial layer. And then now you have an invasive cancer. And then this, everyone already know you have HPV infection. When you get first, because the immunologic factor, you can clear most of them. However, 90% then clear, but you don't know, right? So those who have persistent, let's say 10% individual persistent HPV infection, Eventually, we talked about dysregulation of cellular material, and then just keep going to the right side of the slide, 
since there's no detection, no treatment, and then you're going to advance into high grade and tumor, and eventually you have invasive cancer. This area, once from persistent HPV enter into the cellular dysregulation, this is all we call cold carcinogens. The virus actually caused the cancer. Quickly, I'm not going to dwell on this. I just leave this slide because we keep saying uh, low grade, high grade. What's ASCUS? Uh, ASCUS means at the very beginning, possible your uh, pap smear, you get ASCUS almost like equivocal in the lab. It means atypical. They look not a typical squamous cell, but they don't know what's the significance. They are, they were signed out as ASCUS. And uh, and so there's something is a little bit abnormal. And then there were events in the low grade, high grade. Eventually we have, you know, all this uh, other terminology. And I list this because cytology, sometimes nomenclature is different uh, histology, but they all uh, correspond the same thing. So a uh, warm map, as you can see, the red area is uh, the high, high prevalence. And again, I did the same thing here showing 2007, United States, 11,000 uh, cases, uh, 3,600 deaths. And uh, I just uh, a statistic from 2007. But if you see throughout the entire uh, world, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a worldwide. Uh, if we don't do the test, it, it continues spread and to the next generation. So move on uh, quickly, uh, cytology. So uh, I, you know, the reason we call PEP, and I don't know audience realize, Dr. Pepper Niccolo, the first three letter of Dr. Pepper Niccolo's name is PEP. That's why PEP smear is used as, um, is using his last name, just three letters. And, uh, and to, uh, so PEP smear, 50 years ago, he was a pathologist and then uh, was uh, uh, from Europe and then uh, immigrated to Cornell University where he noticed tumor cell looking in the, in the cervical washing. And then he's very interested in uh, cytology. So he and his partner continued by, by, I think, 1943, they published paper and they showed the abnormal cell. And then uh, by 1950, I think PEP was uh, cleared and started using. So we're talking about, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Because the, you know, the invention developed and implement PEP, and 50% of the cervical cancer cases re reduction throughout the past 40, 50, 60 years. So it's real significant. Quickly, the next slide showing, the, the upper slide showing the old-fashioned PEP. You just go to cervical washing, you make a slide. Notice all the bacteria, you know, could be lactobacillus, you know, being a microbiologist, they, are, they look really crummy, uh, junky. And then the cytologist, what to try to make decision, is this uh, cervical cancer or not? But in 1996, we call liquid, liquid PAP, L-I-Q-U-I-D. So the PAP is liquid, it's in the liquid. So you suspend the cell, the liquid PAP is made of mostly 50% methanol, uh, another company is 50% ethanol. When you put the cells in the alcohol base, the cells get fixed. So it clean up. So suddenly you can see how easy it's to read. By doing this, I think they increase, significantly increase the sensitivity of the pep smear readout. So I show you in the next slide, the prevalence of the genital uh, you know, HPV and US females are roughly 1900 specimen and female 14 to 50 year old. And then uh, overall, 27% of this 1900 sample, they were all positive by test in the lab, positive for HPV. When you separate the age, you see the prevalence, you can see the highest is 20 to uh, 14 year to 24 year. You know, they reach anywhere 40 to 50%. That means why every two young girls, they have HPV. And then the rest, and then, you know, People like me, I'm on this category, but you can see the rest, they all, re, they all stay about the same consistently, 24 to 30% throughout the entire, until you're about 60 year old. That tells us the HPV test 
knee. That's how I need to order the HPV test because it's a treat of a disease. You can get rid of the HPV. So this is quite alarming. And also uh, the screening, and this started a long time ago, and then showing that long time ago, a uh, number of uh, women enrolled for the study from Germany all the way to Portland. And I think uh, our Dr. Bellison maybe the one did the China study. And then uh, PEP, and your PEP means you put the cells on the slide you read. You notice the sensitivity overall, you know, from 50 all the way to 90. So it's very variable. Depends where you are. And then you do the HPV. Now remember HPV, the lab technician, we don't do anything. We put it in the machine. So it's automated. So you, you can see it's, it's much better, okay, 70, but all the way to 100. So, but neither of them is perfect, right? So um, about two, early 2000, 2004, 2002, um, uh, the uh, American College of OBGYN uh, or American Cancer Society recommend, you know, maybe we should do co-testing. Co that means you test both. You take one sample, you do both. So HPV plus PEP become co-testing. You notice sensitivity is really good. And that's why uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, we started co-testing 2004. Every woman over 30 and gets uh, two swab. One is uh, uh, liquid PEP. The other one is, a, is called a uh, a specimen transport, it has a deter detergent. We've been doing the since. But before to get to, uh, for, to go on the other slide, let me tell you, I remind you again, having the high risk 1618 HPV type, you cost 70% of the cancer. And also, we have a vaccine. Vaccine has 1618. It's really important to encourage young girls and young boys get vaccinated and those of us who are parents. And then also studies showing what's the cumulative incident rate. So they follow individual for 10 years and they found out the one that advanced into the cancer the risk and usually are the, the people, their sample has 16 and 18 together is about 31. If the other high risk, you go to 10 years, it's still 30%, 3%. 3% does not mean 0%. So therefore, uh, the newer, and I understand the other vaccine is in the making, they are gonna add other uh, type of HPV. So by now, hopefully everybody listen to the present, hope I convince you that uh, the test for the high risk HPV, when you combine with PET, is more sensitive, it's better for patient, your early detection, your early treatment. And so a positive high-risk HPV is uh, the, the most important risk indicator for the development of the high grade because HPV has been shown is the cause of cervical cancer. So this is a time not to you know, be uh, derogatory. So the laboratory, those of us who work in the clinic lab should sure feel responsible, this is a test we can offer to patient. So what's the standard care? I already mentioned this, American Cancer Society, American Society uh, of uh, uh, OBGYN. Uh, so you can see both society, I think uh, co-testing will be is better than PAP or HPV separately. And so they encourage a lot of hospital institute to start offering co-testing. But this was 2005, 2004, 2002. And uh, it just right here in Cleveland, our hospital started 2004. So here's a Cleveland clinic. I just want to share with you briefly our experience. Um, so and we are, you know, uh, we are look Cleveland, uh, is a, is this is the Lake Erie. It's the Northeast Ohio on the top of Ohio. Uh, across the water will be Canada. And then uh, we, uh, Cleveland Clinic is a 13 bed hospital, 1300 bed hospital. We also have 18 uh, outpatient clinic because this way patients do not have to drive downtown. They drive downtown, they get the blood pressure, uh, they get a parking. So, so they decide to de uh, de deploy, we uh, deploy all the, uh, uh, found a lot of outpatient clinic many years ago to uh, easy for the patient to access to the doctor. We also, uh, 
uh, in, ha, uh, own seven smaller community hospitals where they have hospital bed, they can do a different kind of surgery. And it's a large reference lab. So currently our volume is about 42,000. Now this 42,000 tests are all our uh, reflex or uh, co-testing only. So we do this many, we, we do HPV screen, uh, all the women, and also reflex that is uh, for PAP. And we do this uh, five days a week. Quickly, what we do hybrid catcher, I think the people in the lab will find this. It's a simple technique. If you have a 100, 110 plug, electric plug, and the instrument is real easy, and you can really offer this test, and then that's how we uh, we started the we started the you know 2000. And uh, you take the sample, you lyse with detergent, you heat up the tube, so then you uh, you. Uh, you separate the, all the junk with the DNA. It precipitates on the bottom, so DNA has the double strain. And then you heat up the DNA separate, become single strain. That's when uh, ultimately the company has the RNA probe. That is uh, HPV RNA. It's, there are 13 subtype of HPV sequence, so all stitched in here. So if your patient sample hybridized with this, it tells us the patient is positive. So once they pass it, they form this little like a double helix, and then where they form the helix, and that's where they have the junction of RNA and DNA hybrid, right? That's RNA, this is DNA. So a uh, long time ago, the company called Daijin is uh, being sold to Kaijin. And so Daijin, they develop proprietary monoclonal antibody that will capture the RNA-DNA hybrid. So when you pour your sample into this tube, on the, along the wall of the tube is coated, a film coated of a monoclonal antibody. The minute you drop the, the gamish of the cervical cell, the heated and the other probe, they're going to be uh, captured by the monoclonal. After this, you do extensive washing, you'll find out the only thing you left is the captured HPV DNA in question. And then, how, but it's still invisible. So how do you make this visible? They take the monoclonal antibody same, but they label them with alkaline phosphatase. The little look like cherry type of thing, berry type of, at the end of the IgG chain. Okay, this is, uh, this will bind with also the hybrid on the other side. Once they bind, and this alkaline phosphatase, you add something called lumifast. Lumifast will result in uh, a release of chemiluminescent signal. So suddenly the light emit uh, is reading in the luminometer and then the higher the, so the more uh, darker the light or higher the relative light unit, the higher the HPV sort of very low. It's not a quantitative test, but it does tell you uh, some really weak or weakly reactive and strong reactive sample since we've been doing this since uh, you know we, uh, late 1990s, so we have a lot of experience. So, and this is the machine, and uh, it's really hands-on. Now, because everyone's doing co-testing, and then American Society Clinical uh, 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 Cytopath uh, Pathology guidance showing that for people doing co-testing, suddenly you're gonna have five different categories, so that, cause a little bit complication, but those of us in the lab, we're just busy doing the test. But when I saw the slide, I was a little bit surprised, but in a way I was happy to see they were able to uh, divide the patient's result in five different sets, and then this algorithm recommendation what to do. If you test negative by HPV and the cytology, you, you come back three years, three to five years, the new recommendation. If your HPV is positive, the PET, the slide is negative, you come back 12 months. And the, your reverse is the same. HPV is negative, but you have atypical squamous cell of unknown you know, significance, and then you also come back. So these people, uh, this is uh, no risk people, these people need to come follow up next year. And then if you have HPV pass, also abnormal PET, or PET with uh, uh, and advanced uh, uh, cytology, 
you go right to colposcopy. That's where you go get biopsy, make this uh, biopsy, then go to cytologist. So this is the most severe case on the right left side. Uh, left side is uh, less severe. So now, you know, for me, I've been doing this, you know, 10 years, and we'll start asking, is code testing good enough? And then remember, bear in mind, every time you, women come, you're going to do two tests. One is PEP. Once HPV, many times they don't agree. That's life. Many times they don't you know, agree. And then you're thinking, wow, when they get this, what do the doctors do? What we do is repeat. So by doing this, you realize it gets increased in cost. So in the era of uh, cost repositioning, repositioning and everyone's a lot more aware cost, you want to offer tests not only, not increasing cost, but good tests efficient and fast so the the we start you now we we meet and discuss and with all the new hpv tests available so you perform two tests on all women increase the cost so we want to so how about we just want to do pick one of the good tests and do it so the code testing have a lot of challenges and we've been talking about it but now i think solution is 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 coming so so we're talking about future so the last many years in all the meeting i go is what's best and uh, you know that means what's after hpv co-testing and then so many people uh resource poor people they just do hpv test or this is in, i think uh, ronco is uh, from italy i believe so he did a study showing their data suggests the supplementing HPV test with cytology has no advantage, little advantage. So they recommend we need to reassess using HPV as a primary screen. When positive, we triage to cytology. This way we will be happy we're not overburdened with the lab. And this was 2006, remember the day, 2006. And another study, uh, okay, I'm trying to advance. And uh, so, and then that study show is, um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, it's maybe, you know, pap smear is good. Someone has to read by naked eye. Maybe a molecular pap is going to come. So we had a lot of meetings we talked about. Maybe since the molecular is a lot more sensitive, let's talk about molecular screening. So New England Journal published two, 2007, they talk about we you know, everyone in the room talk about so i have two tests the molecular test is very sensitive but the cytology you know the when the cytologist well trained i read the slide they are very specific and those of us in the audience we work in the lab we will always talk use the more sensitive test to screen and then confirm by a more specific test right with that in mind maybe the time has come so maybe this last time we're going to see this cytology so the so i'm put down the future is here so the government early the government sponsor a study and it's called cervical cancer screening program they only use hpv and this was 2007 i believe i was in one of the meetings they mentioned and in 2009 uh, 2009 we have an Indian uh, physician went back to India and then do the same thing. Since uh, resource poor people don't have time to schedule money to see a doctor, have a nurse collect the pad, no, all that. I believe they were doing self-collection and the only test for HPV. So in the low, low resource setting, a single round HPV test, that's one time was associated with significant reduction in the number of advanced cervical cancer deaths from cervical cancer. This study went on for many years, finally published in New England Journal. It was really exciting. I remember we got it, everyone's talking about it, and this is a really good. And of course, no, local newspaper quickly say, yes, new DNA test, someday gonna replace PAP. That means we're gonna have a molecular PAP, right? So, uh, last month, and the good news, last month's FDA finally cleared a test. Uh, it's, uh, it's from the company Roche. It's called Cobas HPV test. And it's done by real-time PCR. What is real-time PCR? 
different from PCR. And this one is all the sample is in one tube. One sample is in a tube, but you can put down 14 different kind of uh, sequence of probe you know, in one setting and all together. So you can you notice the Roche test, their probe, the PCR primer probe, include 14 high-risk HPV. You can see that they put the 12 high-risk here, the two real bad one in here, here. What does channel mean? When you do real-time PCR, the multiple channel in the PCR uh, thermocycler, and the channel divided by different kind of wavelengths depends how you uh, 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 put a dye on the probe. So, so you can see the 12 high risk, a different dye, DYE, and the channel 2 is a different dye, and channel 3 is 18, and channel 4 is internal control. So they will not run into each other in the computer. So they did a study for many years and enrolled 40, 50,000 individuals. So you can read here, it's, a, it's an integrated genotype assay. Not only they detect all the high risk, at the end of the test, they also can tell you whether your patient has 16, 18. Because remember, these two are the one, 70% of the cancer caused due to these two. So we usually call 16, 18 uh, oncogenic HPV uh, types. So this allow reporting the whole result, also report do they have the real bad ones. So what's the test algorithm? So the FDA Rick, uh, has an a expert group uh, panel uh, discuss, and then finally the recommendation is as such that uh, uh, you have your patient tested. If your patient is negative for everything, Negative, you just go follow up. And it could be three or five years, and then I think I don't know the final uh, has decided that. And then right now, most of us are using the three-year follow-up when you are negative, uh, you're normal. When you have twelve high-risk, this you need a reflex back to cytology, and the cytology they will take the thin prep, make a smear, and they they read normal follow up, just like the HPV negative follow up. And then if they have even askets or higher, so the abnormal, you go right to the biopsy and biopsy is gonna be read by the cytologist. Then if your result is 16 or 18 or 16 plus 18, you go right to biopsy. This is the test that's very specific. And by doing that, they can go on to treatment. Remember again, HPV cervical cancer is a preventable disease. Bear in mind, the only way you can take advantage of that is to get tested. And that is a, a, a very, very important uh, to me message to everyone. So conclusion, HPV co-testing, do, they do improve patient care for the past many years. And then because there's some conflict to result, and then we are been waiting for the next generation test, so it says the future is here. FDA finally approved HPV testing as a primary screen. That means that's, so when you collect the pap smear, it's gonna go to the lab first. And we'll do the test. When it's positive, of the 12 or positive 16, 18, the vial will automatically forward to cytology. And this was only a month ago. And the endorse, they also approved the algorithm. So primary HPV screen, using the HPV test, offer HPV 16, 18, while reporting 12 other high-risk type. We, they, you know, people call this all-in-one test. All-in-one run from one sample can be directly reflexed to cytology. So, uh, and, and so, so this is the end of the story about the laboratory test. The good news, now we have a solution and the several other companies are working on the same thing. So now when the women come to the office and the clinician can have good news to tell them, they can detect accurately, and if you detect positive, they can go on treat, treating. And this test is being recommended for women 25 years and older. So the onus is on our primary care, OBGYN and clinicians to explain to the and their you know, patient convinced to them 
And I'm pretty sure they're going to take many years for women that have been so used to comfortable with the pet. It will take time to change. But change is good. Change is for, for better for uh, all the people behind us, younger generation. Uh, so so uh, just this slide to remind everyone, there are two vaccines. And then also 2009, this vaccine and then the, the vaccine, the 1618 Cervex from uh, Burroughs Welcome, also FDA cleared. This is the only one that's clear for male, boys, and the girls. And the hope all the parents uh, see this, uh, heard this presentation, and then check the data, talk to the doctor, make sure you have their kids. Even their kids 20, they need to get vaccinated. And boys and girls, after all, girls get contracted HPV from sexual contact from boys. So here is, uh, uh, like I read, how you can help protect both your son and daughter with HPV vaccine and big smile on both boys and girls. And then I want to thank everyone in my lab who supported uh, me for me to able to do this talk. And then I want to also special acknowledge Dr. Janice Matthew Greer, who supplied me several really, really important slides. And uh, that's the end of my uh, talk. And thank you uh, very, very much uh, for signing up, participate in this uh, webinar. And then I guess uh, uh, hopefully everyone, uh, you know, we're going to start with Q&A, but everyone can submit a question by typing in. And then that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm reading the Duke University, Naveen Ganda. Question, how expensive, how expensive is each HPV PEP screening test? Uh, I know the HPV test, you know, I'm a lab person. HPV test is around, it costs about 20, a little bit over 20. And PEP smear, I'm not quite sure, probably comparable. And uh, that's as far as no, perhaps better uh, check with your uh, clinician. Uh, and it's affordable and then also uh, most time insurance uh, do, uh, insurance do cover. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I didn't click the right thing. How expensive is uh, uh, each HPV PEP screening test? Uh, remember the screening test down the line is gonna be HPV. Right now at the Cleveland Clinic, we use HPV and PEP. And that's, I know HPV costs us around, you know, uh, mostly 20 some dollar. PEP, I don't know, maybe 20, 40 because you're paying someone to do that. But it's affordable. And then in the Cleveland Clinic, and this is reimbursed, uh, reimbursable uh, uh, from the different insurers. More questions? Any more questions? Let me check Q&A. Do you try, okay, do you try to educate scientists around the world with today's new knowledge? The question is, uh, do you try to educate scientists around the world with the today's new knowledge. I'm not the expert, but I try my best to get the message out. Uh, so the answer is yes, all of us, uh, all of us in the hospital or out of the hospital in this uh, health career really should uh, do the homework and uh, pass around the world. That's what you call educated scientists. And then I will hope to uh, pass my message to at least few of you. Uh, the answer is yes, it's very important. Is the test usable for other 
types of sample. Uh, so uh, the uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, we did a study. Uh, we actually did a study. Uh, let's see, answer. Did I clip it right? Click uh, tag Q and A. Okay, we the uh, we actually did a study uh, recently. It will be published the next few months, uh, and we're using the fine needle aspirate, so the tumor cell from uh, head neck people with head neck cancer. And then we did about hundred sample, and then uh, about thirty forty percent the tumor cell they were positive for HPV, and they were all HPV sixteen, and then so we were. Uh, really alert. However, remember, um, when, H, uh, when the head neck cancer is positive for HPV, actually it's supposed to have a much better prognostic uh, result because it's treatable. It responds to radiation therapy. So in a way, uh, when you have a head neck cancer, getting the HPV test could be a, a good thing and then actually help the doctor to manage the patient, to treat the patient. Let's see. Any more question? Okay. Are there any point of care? Good question. Any point of care HPV tests available? I understand um, in Europe, there's one. Remember, when you do molecular tests, it is not dipstick like uh, the flu test or glucometer, you know, glucose test or the quick HPV, HIV serology test. So the answer is yes, there are several rapid HPV tests, but it takes a little bit less than an hour. Uh, they can do it because so you need to have the nucleic acid hybridized. You know, so, so the answer is uh, there are point of care, but instead of point of care for HPV PEP, they actually call uh, a rapid HPV test. So the answer is yes, uh, that is uh, there's available. I understand there's several, a uh, couple in China, couple in Europe. Let's see, any more question coming in? Oh, uh, Rosanna, Martinelli, thank you for listening to my presentation. I appreciate your uh, email, and I thank you all for uh, uh, signing in for this uh, webinar. I'm waiting to see uh, more questions. Okay, I think uh, uh, I think there no, no more question, right? Thank you very much.